Hi, how's it going? This session, I wouldn't really call it a tutorial, more of a session, it's a bit of revision. In between videos, I sometimes make some pretty big changes. And in hindsight, I figured that a first person camera might be worth its own video. At the moment, if we run this code, we will just see a spinning block. It's nice, but let's build a first person camera. At the same time, let's structure our program so it's a little easier to read and extend. One of the most common software architectures is the model view controller pattern. The idea is that the state of the environment and the rules for updating it is stored in model classes. The rendering machinery and logic is in view classes. And sitting in between them is a controller which passes messages between them. This also gives us a framework for our refactor. To start with, our model classes. Now the model classes are everything which is in our environment, all of the objects, as well as some way to group them, work with them, and update them. So at the moment we have a cube. I'm happy with that. Let's keep the cube. Let's add a player class. So when we create a player class, we will give them a position. Good. So the player has a position. In addition to that, we want to give them um, angles that they are looking in. Now, typically in 3D views, there are two angles. There's an altitude and an azimuth, if I'm remembering that correctly. But the idea is we have an angle, which I'm going to call theta. And that is where we're looking in the horizontal plane, as in northeast, southwest. And then we'll have another angle called phi. And that will be where we are looking vertically up and down. I'm also going to make a function which builds our, our three really important vectors. That is our forwards vector, our up and our right vector. I'm going to call that update vectors. And in the initializer, we'll call that straight away after creating. Okay, so what we'll do is we will create the forwards vector by hand. I'm not sure how familiar you are with spherical coordinates. Um, go look that up. I think I've got many videos. It's one of those things I always mention it from time to time. I always talk about spherical coordinates a little bit, um, but I'll give you the long and short of it. So theta is our angle in the horizontal. So if we were just looking not up and down, just directly forwards, then it would be um, cosine, cosine for the uh, x, and then sine for the y, and then for the z, if we were just looking directly horizontal, there would be no up and down. But we don't just want that, we want to tilt this according to our, tilt this according to our phi, and if we think about it, let's say it doesn't actually matter. We could reverse this. Um, we'll say the cosine component of the phi is the horizontal component of us looking up and down. And then we'll add this as well, because this y looking is in the horizontal plane. But then when it comes to z, we will take the opposite of cosine will take the sine component of the phi. Okay, cool. So again, this is one of these things. I feel like I've talked about it a number of times. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a vector, which is the regular um, up direction, no matter what. Okay, so I hope you'll agree with me that um, th this is up to us, by the way, um, we could pick Y as the, the vertical axis, but I like Z. So the reason we have this global up is our up may not be parallel with that, that global up direction. So we just 
Just being careful here. So what I want to do is I want to calculate the fundamental three directions, which are the forwards vector, the right vector, and the up vector. Now the right vector, we want an angle which is perpendicular to both the forwards and up vector. So we achieve that by taking the cross product between these two vectors. So this is a bit of an exercise. If you take your right hand right now and you point it forwards and then you curl your fingers in the up direction, see that your thumb is pointing to the right. And so that's how we know that this is giving us the correct right vector. And then we can completely ignore that global up and we can calculate our own up vector. Now, what can we do here? Well, if we take our right hand and we curl our, point our thumbs to our right and then curl them to our forwards direction, then our thumb is pointing up. And this is telling us that that is going to give us the up vector. So we go fingers pointing to the right, curling forwards. That will give us our, our up vector for our camera. And then do whatever you want with your hand. Move it around and you'll see that your thumb is always going to track the top of your head, if that even makes sense. Okay, so we have the player class. I'm pretty happy with the player class. I'm not going to change anything. Now, with our first person camera, we will be walking around and spinning around, but the functions to update that will be controlled by a different class. So this is just data that we can read and write to. Okay, now the class which holds everything and controls it, I'm going to call the scene. You can call this whatever you want, I'm going to call it the scene. Now for the initializer, we don't really need much. We don't need any arguments. We'll just go, go ahead and make one. Okay, so we're going to have a list of cubes, potentially a lot of them, and then we're going to have a single player. Okay, so the initializer for the scene is just creating everything which will exist in our world at the moment. It's very lonely. The next thing we'll need is we'll need an update function. Now I'm going to take a rate, and the reason for that is I want my update to be frame rate independent. Now, some people may have thoughts on that. This is how I'm going to do it. And um, yeah, we'll just go for it. So what we'll do is we will loop through each of the cube objects and we will set the cubes Eulers, th their angles. So we'll go um, Okay, so all this is doing is rotating each of the cubes by a fixed amount. Um, this will either be slower or faster depending on how quick the frame rates, how quick the rendering is happening. And that's it. So we're keeping it nice and simple. Now also if we look down below in our app, I think we had this before. So yeah, we've got a cube. Let's get rid of that. I'm just gonna slowly show how we're taking our app and putting parts of it into other classes. So we have all of this down here yeah here we have the update we'll just get rid of that good so the next question is okay so the update function just spins our cubes how is a player going to move so the idea is the scene we can tell the scene to move the player so in order to do that the scene will have a function to move the player Okay, so we have change in position. Now, just as a safety net, we'll make sure that that is a NumPy array, and then we'll add that to the player's position. So the scene is talking directly to the player and saying, move yourself. 
Okay, the next part is we want to spin the player. Okay, so we have our spin player function. This takes in a change in theta and applies that change, um, keeping things modular 360 basically. So just making sure if we spin around twice, our angle doesn't go to 720 degrees. That's a bit weird. Um, next thing we'll do is we'll take into account the vertical spinning. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're adding the change in phi to the player's phi, and if this puts it at an angle above, uh, well, 90 degrees, I guess we could say, is straight up. So if we put it above, um, let's say, 89 degrees, we'll just cap it at that. And then this is a common trick. We will also say if it goes below negative 89 degrees, which is pretty close to straight down, then we'll just cap it at a minimum of negative 89. So this just makes sure the player cannot look too far up or too far down. So we do that, we update the player's angles, and then we tell the player to update their vectors. Very good, very good. The view classes are involved with uh, basically drawing the things involved in drawing and the logic involved in drawing. The drawing will mostly be handled, will actually all be handled by uh, the graphics engine class. So we'll make one of those. Now, if we go ahead and look back at the app that we had originally, let's pop over here, we have these objects here, uh, the cube mesh, I hate that. You know when you grab something and you cut paste it, but then you accidentally copy blank space where you were going to paste it? I dislike that. Okay, so we have the cube mesh and the wood texture. So we'll go ahead and grab those. So at this point, the engine has created its assets. These will be used to render. And then we also want to set some options. So if we go, we see this create shader, let's grab that function and put it inside. Okay, so we just copy pasted that over. This is a standard function for creating a shader. And then we look up here, we have these bits. The OpenGL settings. So let's grab these. So as you can see, we set the background color for the program. We create a shader based on these files, and then we use it. And then we set the texture to um, texture unit zero. This is not strictly necessary, but if we have multiple textures, it's a good idea. We also enable the depth test. Okay, so then if we pop up to the top, we can also see here, this is probably important. So we'll grab this bit. Okay, so we set up the projection transformation and then we send that over to the shader. We only set it once at the beginning. And then additionally, we look at the shader and query the location where the model matrix should be uploaded. And we get that location so we can upload to it later. Uh, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to make a new one because I'm not just going to have model, I'm going to have a view as well. Have a view matrix that we're going to pass in. So it's probably a good idea to switch over to the shader this will occur in the vertex shader. We'll have a uniform 4x4 matrix 
called view and the, this will be applied in our transformation here so again we have our position we transform it by the model so the position and rotation basically and then we take that and transform it by the view now what the view does is it spins things around moves things around to simulate what um, things would look like if we were looking from a certain perspective so the way things work in OpenGL if I spin my head to the left it looks like everything like I've moved to the left I feel like I've moved to the left but the truth is from my perspective the whole world has moved to the right so the view transformation basically does the inverse of what the camera is doing to make the camera the center of the world and then on top of that we apply the projection and that's our standard model view projection stack a lot of times these three matrices are multiplied into one so that this matrix multiplication is not performed multiple times or at least the view projection is stuck into one but this is fine for the moment we'll leave that there so we have that and then we're going to need two more functions we're going to need a function to render everything and then a function to destroy everything so if we go back here look at the main loop we can grab from refresh screen right down to that bit okay so I'll just step through this we refresh the screen by clearing the color and depth buffers then we make sure that we're using our program then what I'm going to do is modify this a little bit so I have a view transform which is created by this function which is called create look at now create look at takes a few arguments let's give this a second so we need the eye where we're looking from the target where we're looking at the up vector and then the data type as normal so for the eye we'll say we're taking in a scene object and a scene object is an instance of the scene as defined up above so we should be able to query that scenes player so we'll say okay get the player get their position and that is the eye that is where we're looking from the target will be the same as before the player's position but plus the player's forwards vector okay and then for the up vector we will get the players up vector this was calculated before very convenient and there we have it that's our view transform so the next thing we need to do is send that view transform to the shader so we'll say okay okay so we send that through to the shader remember uh, this one is a number of matrices that we're sending through this gl false is whether to transpose them that's a, a false on that one Alrighty, so that is looking good now i'm just gonna clear this off and now we'll look through all of the cubes in the scene side note i'm not sure why this code has become grayed out i believe vs code believes this branch of code will never be reached which doesn't make sense because it definitely will be reached there's nothing here which will terminate this code i don't know why it's just a weird thing i don't like it anyway so what we're going to do here is uh, we look through each cube and then we set up the model transform so we start with the identity and then we stack onto that this rotation 
which we've done in previous videos, that's fine. And then we stack onto that, this translation. So we go to the uh, rotation, then go to the appropriate position, and then we send that through to the shader. Okay. So it's probably a good idea to actually bind these resources before we loop through. It won't make a difference here, but it might make a difference later on. Okay, so we bind those resources and then go ahead and draw. And then we'll flip the screen. Okay, so that's looking good. Now, there is one difference I'm going to make. Instead of calling Pygame Display Flip, I'll call GL Flush. And GL Flush is, um, let's say it's just a different way of updating the view, which I'll get to that later on when I do the controller class. But for now, I'm happy with this. We'll just go to the quit function. We'll grab that. Get rid of the pie game quit. Mm. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So we just, uh, when the renderer is exited, it will destroy all of its controlled resources. Okay. Okay, so I'm happy with this. I'm happy with the mesh class, but I am going to make a change to the material class because I'm going to use a different image loading library. I'm just going to go up the top and I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to import something called pill, which is a, what is it, Python image library? Anyway, and I'll just import image. Now, just a side note, because I am using this for the first time in this video series, the way we would install this basically is through pip. So we would say, I guess we could say upgrade pip. I don't know if we have to, but that options there for us, but it's this one here. It's pip install upgrade pillow. Uh, here it is. Okay, pillow and pill cannot coexist in the same environment. Before installing pillow, please uninstall pill. So I, I don't think this is an issue. I don't think, yeah, just this, this one here should work fine. But uh, yeah, just be aware of that. <clears throat> but um, in my experience, I've never had any issues installing this library and no one who I've seen working with it has had any issues either. All right, that was a mouthful. So the point is we're going down to this material and I want to just change some of the, the function calls a little bit. Okay, so just going through this one bit at a time. I'm happy with this. I'm happy with all of this, setting the, setting the options. I am just going to change this to nearest MIP map linear. And what a MIP map is, is basically it selects the image to display based on how big or small um, an image is. And this can help to reduce some texture issues. So here we are. Just pop in here and this is where I'm going to change the image loading um, code. So I'll go Okay, so now I'm using image to open this up. And we can say, what do we have? Image width, image height. We can get that by simply querying it here. <clears throat> image size going to just convert that image. Now what this does, we could say, wait a second, but our image already was RGBA. Why are we converting it to RGBA? Well, what this does is it reads the image data and gives it those extra channels if they don't exist. So if we've just got an RGB image, this will give it an empty alpha channel. Um, and if we've just got 
a black and white grayscale image, it might just be R, it inserts all these extra channels. So this just means we don't have to check how many channels the image has, it's perfectly fine. So now to get the image data, what we do is we go image to bytes and we can also just cast this to a bytes object by calling the bytes constructor on it. Okay, so now we can upload this to the, the 2D texture and that should be fine and then generate MIP maps on it and the rest of this should be fine. So, <clears throat> fingers crossed, we'll find out in a second when we debug it. But yeah, that is our... That is our view class. Alright, so we're almost done. We just need to create our app. Which, I, I know we've got an app here, but I'm going to modify this a little bit. We're going to... It's going to be our controller class. Which is, it's going to have a instance of the model, an instance of the scene, and it's going to have an instance of the renderer, and it will take our input and pass messages between them. Now, to start with, you may be thinking, hey, why did we change from Pygames image loading to this other library? The reason for that is I'm going to get rid of Pygame. I'm going to change to GLFW. Now, I've gone through this in other videos a number of times, but the reason that I want to change to GLFW is that the mouse is more accurate. And when we get to high frame rates, having accurate mouse movement will be really important for looking around smoothly. So if we don't have GLFW, no problem. All we need to do is something like pip install GLFW. I think that's the one. Okay. Anyway, that's fine. We have GLFW. And as always, Pip always says it has a new version. That's fine, we can leave that there. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and import GLFW. And then I also want to import all of the constants. So I'll say import. The constants are in a module called GLFW. And I'll just go with that. So. Note that there are a whole bunch of errors. That's fine. We'll take this one step at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a bunch of named constants to start with. That's fine. We'll stick with that. Um, so these are just a bunch of constants which will be used, I guess, in the control of the app. And also, why not? We'll just have that there. Um, now, I'm also going to make a function which will initialize GLFW and return the created window. Now, this function should be pretty straightforward, so I'm just going to go ahead and code it and then I'll explain how it's working. Okay, so the first part of this function, what we've got right now, is just setting a bunch of options. A lot of these should make sense. For instance, the OpenGL version, we're going to run OpenGL in core mode, not uh, legacy, not immediate mode. Some of these other ones are a little weirder. So this forward compatibility is a Mac um, compatibility issue. For whatever reason, it requires that we set this. Okay, so there it is. We've done it. We've ticked that box. Then I actually don't want to run this in double buffer mode. If we run GLFW in, in double buffer mode, it limits the frame rate to 60 frames per second, 
I don't want that. I want to just run at whatever speed I can. So I'm going to set that to false. And that is what the renderer's GL flush function is doing. So instead of flipping the double buffer, flipping the buffer, we just call GL flush and that performs all the draw commands and synchronizes everything, basically clears clears any pending draw commands and it's how we keep things moving. So for the next section I'm going to create the window and do some more work with it. Okay, so what else do we do with it? Well, we tell GLFW to create a window of the given width and height. We give it a title. These next two arguments are not necessary. We have the monitor we're going to run on, not necessary, just whatever the default is. And then any programs we're sharing resources with, again, not necessary. Then that window has an OpenGL context. We set that as the current context that we're working with. And we also set the cursor so that it's hidden and then return the window. Pretty straightforward. So the way this will be used, we can close this down. We'll go to the, the bottom down here and we'll go ahead and create one of these. So we'll say, create that. And I'm going to modify this so that the app takes the window instance in its creation. Okay, so we'll go up to the app now and we'll give it a window. Now we can get rid of all of this stuff. Okay, so um, Okay, so as you can see the app of course, it has a window, yeah. Um, but it has a reference to a, a view class and a model class, and it's going to be passing messages between them. I'm also going to set up a bunch of variables which will be important in calculating the frame rate. So what I want is I want to calculate the frame rate every second. So I want to get the last time at which the frame rate was calculated, which will just get the current time of the system right now. And this will just be a temporary variable. Um, then we'll get the number of frames, which have been rendered in one second. And we'll get the frame time, the current frame time, which is a number of milliseconds per frame. Okay, cool. So those variables will be used later on. Then we jump to the main loop. So in the main loop, yep, we'll just, yeah, go while running and we'll check events. Now check events is a little bit different. So we'll go. Okay, so this is how we handle events in GLFW. We can do a, a simple function call. If we want to check whether a key has been pressed, we query the key, specify which key we're looking for in which window, and that will return the status. And if it's equal to GLFW press, then the key's down, the key's been pressed. So We've got that. Now, if we run this at the moment, it's going to throw an error. And the reason is, well, it won't throw an error immediately, but when GLFW is running, there's a whole bunch of events which are happening in the background, like 
mouse motion, got focus, lost focus, uh, key pressed, key released, and so on. So if we call poll events, that will flush the queue of events and um, yeah, stop stop the, the queue from backlogging, if that makes sense. Now, I'm also going to make two functions, one to handle keys and one to handle the mouse. So I'll start with handle keys. Okay, so the idea is I want to get the state of the keys. I want to see which keys are down, but there could be a bunch of different combinations. So the way I'm going to do this is basically with uh, bit fields or bit masks. So we have W, A, S, D, and I'm going to give each of them a unique value. It's going to be a power of two. And the reason for that is as an integer, these will represent different bits being set within the integer. So what happens if I've got W that's forwards, that's an offset of zero degrees. If I've got um, A that's left, that's an offset of 90 degrees from my forwards direction. It seems a little strange. So imagine you're looking forwards and where you are right now is the forwards x-axis. Well, to your left is the positive y-axis. That's a, a 90 degree shift, if that makes sense. Now, we also have combinations. So one plus two is three. So if the number is equal to three, then W and A must be pressed. And well, we have, you know, part way between um, 0 and 90 is 45 degrees. So I'm just setting this up. It's a common error to just simply apply movement. And then it depends on kind of the last key that was pressed, or if two keys are both on to add the movement. And that makes it so that uh, moving diagonally is faster than moving directly forwards. That's a little bit dodgy. Anyway, so I'll just quickly start filling this in. Now I've got an X here, and the reason for this is that W is forwards, S is backwards, and so if we see a 5, then we have keys which are going to cancel each other out, and nothing will happen. So again, we know that W and S are going to cancel each other out, but if we have A down as well, well, A is 90 degrees, so we'll just yeah, move 90 degrees. So it's a little bit exhaustive, but hopefully you can see this will go through all combinations. Paste that. Okay, there we go. All right, so what I want to keep track of is I want to keep track of what the key combo is. We'll start with zero. And then based on the key combo, we'll have a direction modifier, which is what we want to walk and what offset we want to walk at, if that makes sense. So the first step here is we're going to collect all of the key presses that we're interested in. Okay, now let's change this actually. Yeah, I changed my, I changed my mind. I'm going to change this code on the fly. So we'll go to the um, go to the initializer and we'll set up a dictionary.
and there we have it yep okay cool so this is saying for a given key combo what is the offset that we want to walk at okay good so this means we can neaten up the rest of our code quite a bit so we've got all of this now we can check if that's a valid combo so we can say if combo is in Okay, so we get the appropriate modifier, and then we will set our change in position. Okay. Cool. So we take the player's direction. Uh, of course, all of this only executes if we have a key combination which is valid. So this will only be executing if a key is down, at least one key, and it's valid. So we get the direction modifier, add that to the player's current direction, and set this up in our walking forwards vector, if that makes sense. Then we pass it along to move the player. Okay, so I'm happy with that. We've got the handle keys function. We can then call that before we poll our events. Okay, and the next function I'm going to make is the mouse. Okay, cool. So this should really be self-explanatory. We're getting the position of the mouse. We're getting its deflection away from the center of the screen. A horizontal deflection will spin us around in the horizontal plane. A vertical deflection will spin us up and down. We tell the scene to spin its player, and then we reset the mouse to the center of the screen so that we can get the deflection in the next so now we can go ahead and handle the mouse. The next thing I want to do is I want to calculate the frame rate. Okay, cool. So every frame, every time we get the current time that we're at right now, and then we get the time difference since the last time the frame rate was calculated. And this is in seconds. So what we want to do is if we want to calculate this every second, then we will only execute the following code if that is less than or equal to uh, one. Bigger than or equal to one, I mean. Okay, cool. So, as we can see here, if more than a second has passed, then we calculate the number of frames which were rendered during that time interval. Just checking that we aren't accidentally doing crazy things. Okay, so then we display the frame rate on the window title. We update the last time so that we will, you know, have an accurate last time to compare to next time. Now I'm setting the number of frames to negative one because this will automatically update it by one. So really I'm setting the number of frames to zero because zero frames have been rendered right now. 
then I get the frame time. Now the frame time is a number of milliseconds, so a thousand milliseconds. So if I take a thousand milliseconds, divide by the frames per second, that will give me the number of milliseconds per frame. Okay, cool. So I've got that. And now I'm so close. I'm just going to make a quit function. And the purpose of the quit function is to send a message to the renderer. To, to quit. Okay, so now I'm going to put it all together. So I'll go back to the main loop. So what are we doing? We handle the keys, then we handle the mouse, then we clear off and poll the events. And then what I'll do is I'll send a message to my And for the rate, I'll go self frame time divide by 16.7. The reason for that is 16.2 thirds, 16.6667 is <clears throat> 60 frames per second. All right. So then I'll tell my renderer to render my scene. There we've got it. Now for the timing section. <clears throat> For the timing section, I'll just calculate my frame rate. And there we have it. <clears throat> oh, what's with this? Okay, and there we have it. So I'll just give that a shot. See which marvelous errors I've made. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, what's up with that? Okay, has no attribute cube. So that would be Strange. Let me just search. Uh, yes, this shouldn't be self cube. This should just be cube. Okay, I think that's all right. There we see it. Okay, so we're going at like 2000 frames per second or something. We can move the mouse and it moves. We can, oh, that's too fast. That's too fast. Okay, no problem. We can fix that. So we'll just go to the app handle keys and I'll just go make it absurdly slow for the time being but yeah that should that's not too bad <clears throat> that's not too bad okay so there we have a first person camera and there it is this basic first person camera will be used a lot in our future videos it's pretty good for basic demos plus as a bonus we have a robust software framework which we can easily extend in the future anyway hope you enjoyed this session and happy coding bye